A great story can keep me hooked for hours, and they're often fronted by excellent protagonists. So for this week, I'll share with you in no particular order eight of my favourite JRPG heroines that take the helm in their respective journeys. I will also say that though I won't be mentioning specific moments within the games, I will be digging a bit into their character arc, so spoiler warning there. Finally, two rules will bind me here in that there will only be one character per franchise, and they have to be a protagonist or at least share the protagonist role in their respective games. And with that in mind, we kick off with Kasane Randall from Scarlet Nexus. You're going to notice a common theme throughout much of this list, that I greatly support characters who act upon their motivation rather than saying they will. Actions speak louder than words and all that jazz. I feel that the perception of Kasane will be affected with who you start with first in Scarlet Nexus. If you choose Yuito, you'll probably be left with a sour taste that could skew your opinion of her, but if you start with Kasane, you'll not only get her motivation from a first-person viewpoint, but you'll also get a much deeper journey, at least in my opinion. The development of Kasane throughout her route is actually pretty good. She starts off as a confident yet standoffish individual who trusts no one but her sister Naomi, but eventually she begins to trust those around her and the bonding events back at home base demonstrate that well. Her back and forth with the likes of Shiden is enjoyable to watch and is one of many examples that illustrates the slowly changing mentality of Kasane. There's no doubt that some of her decisions seem irrational at times, especially if you've played Yuito's route first, which leaves you plenty of questions as to the motivation behind her actions, but I think once you've seen it for yourself, it actually makes sense why she chooses the method she does. Not to mention she appears to be more at the centre surrounding the plot of Scarlet Nexus, having a good deal of exposure to many of the key players. Next on the pedestal is Sakuna from Sakuna of Rice and Ruin. Her name is literally in the title of the game, so yeah, she's up to the penalty spot. Sakuna is definitely one of the highlights in this beautifully crafted game from Edelweiss. Being the daughter of both a harvest goddess and a war god, she naturally takes on both of their credentials, becoming this badass hybrid. She farms and she kills. Again, it's another case of a character who can take matters into their own hands. I also have to give props to her design. The art style in Sakuna is wonderfully stylized already, and Sakuna is the jewel within that crown. I don't know, man. The hair and Raymond are a big plus for me. Then you get into the character itself, how she ends up banished on a demon-infested island with a group of lower realm dwellers, this is what they're called in-game, I am not being elitist, and slowly she starts to enjoy her time sharing her days in the hamlet left by her late mother. Despite her strength, Sakuna displays a startling level of vulnerability during the game, she's far from the flawless goddess many would expect her to be. Her ultimate seclusion following the passing of her parents is a driving force for much of her development, and it's presented very well throughout the journey. Turning Sakuna from a spoilt higher realm dweller living the life of luxury to an all-round more pleasant individual that still maintains the spunky attitude. Talking about spunky attitudes, that comes to mind for our next entry in Kaine from Near Replicant, or as said by a very wise book, The Hussy. Kaine is actually one of the more deceivingly deep characters on this list, which is to be expected when you're playing something like Nier, things aren't going to be given to you in plain black and white, and you have to dig in to piece it all together yourself. What you'll find, if you're willing to put in the effort, are mannerisms that go beyond their surface appearance. To the casual eye, Kaine is brash, rude, and noticeably destructive, but that's spurred by an introverted and insecure human being, something that is made clearer to the player as they witness the five roots. The problem for Kaine is that despite her self-loathing, she's put in an environment that messes her up even more in her home village, which is definitely not the nicest area to live in. That ensuing segregation forces her into a corner, and her best form of self-defense is to put up these walls around her, partially to keep others out, but also to keep her own nature hidden within. Kaine is ashamed of herself, a characteristic that is made more apparent as the game goes on, and that's one reason why I feel the main characters in Replicant are so strong, as they're ultimately a boon for each other. In the case of Kaine, she finds a lot of familiarity with Emil, a sort of mutual understanding between them considering their circumstances. And though her methods to circumvent her own shortcomings are notably in your face, like her outfit for example, that is purely what Kaine is all about, expressing anger and aggression as a defence for her own vulnerability. And since we're referring to characters who like to lash out, it segues pretty well to our next entry in Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII. Now, I've come out on record and said that while I don't consider Final Fantasy XIII to be the worst game ever, it's certainly not my favourite game in the series, and even though I played it a second time just over two years ago, it just reaffirmed that the issues I had with it the first time around were still there, and not through a lack of understanding. Thankfully, one of the shining lights within XIII was its main heroine in Lightning. While many of the characters, barring Saz, fall into 
very noticeable tropes, Lightning felt more of a middle ground character, especially when all other members are present. It gives her a distinct neutrality that naturally lends to her being the one that some of these members look up to in the later stages. And it's not a surprise to see why. Lightning is extremely capable as an individual, something that is made clear throughout the first game. Losing both of her parents at an early age, she had to put aside her own weaknesses for the sake of her sister, changing her name from Claire to Lightning as a representation of that. And though most of her personality is tied to this stoic and badass archetype, she still maintains a sense of familial burden on certain occasions. When it comes to her sister, Lightning also demonstrates many times that she doesn't have any time for poses, case in point Snow. She can't stand people who display an ego but can't back it up, and she holds this viewpoint because she's been stepping up ever since her mid-teens, essentially sacrificing her own childhood for the benefits of Sarah. She's been on the front lines both physically and metaphorically, so she knows what it takes. Of course, throughout the journey, Lightning starts to develop meaningful relationships, especially with the likes of Hope, who she sees as a surrogate sibling, but she maintains that persona of action over words all the way to that final game in the trilogy. And we're not done with the badass babes as our next heroine is Velvet from Tales of Berseria. Velvet is motivated by one thing, vengeance, and that is made very clear to players from the start of the game. If anything, the core theme of Berseria, this idea of emotions and the meaning of being human, are illustrated brilliantly by Velvet herself, or at least the bad side of it. Velvet's character demonstrates that raw, unbridled emotion can essentially turn you into a monster, both figuratively and mentally. With her goal of vengeance, Velvet demonstrates on many occasions in the early stages that she only cares about her mission, and she'll do anything she has to in order to make it happen, even condemning innocence to a cruel fate. But there are clear moments within this narrative that show a line that Velvet will not cross, in particular this idea of never coming between a brother-sister relationship, not in the incest way. Velvet herself knows all too well the pain of losing a dear sibling, and as a result, there are certain moments within Berseria that force her to reflect on her own actions, as she questions whether she ultimately became the same monsters who took away her own reason for living in the first place. It's a very poor poignant character arc, and though Velvet never really loses that edge over the course of Berseria, it's clear that her interactions with the other characters, especially Fee, allow her to finally start moving on from the night that sets everything in motion. She never becomes an outright hero, but she purifies this seething aura of hatred that surrounds her to become something more akin to an anti-hero, and I love that direction as it allows Berseria to stand apart from its contemporaries. Now, we've had quite a few serious gals in the past few entries, and so now we'll bump it back to a more innocent one in Theris from Atelier Theris, The Alchemist and the Mysterious Journey. Now, compared to some of the previous protags, Theris herself isn't overly complex in terms of her character arc and motivations, but she gets onto this list because of how pure said motivation is, and it's what makes Theris my personal favourite of the Mysterious Tetralogy. Theris herself grows up in the cave town of Atona, and at the age of 15, she has never seen the outside world. One of her greatest solaces is to simply peek through the open top of the mountain and look at the sky beyond it, yearning to one day follow in her older sister's footsteps and witness the world for herself. Upon being introduced to alchemy, Theris gets that opportunity and sets off on her mysterious journey. And it's this naivety as a whole that makes Theris so endearing. Her behaviour while exploring the world is expressive and filled with excitement, which makes sense considering that many of the phenomena she sees on her travels are a first experience for her. And this attitude of Theris reflects perfectly on the overall tone of the game. Though it's definitely not the best game within the mysterious arc, it's light-hearted approach is illustrated by the titular heroine herself, yielding one of the more relaxing experiences that a JRPG fan can have. And now we move to Ys, and if you know me, I absolutely love Dana from Ys 8 Lacrimosa of Dana. But, I talk a lot about Ys 8, I mean you can't blame me, it's one of my favourite games of all time, and Dana is one key reason for that. So just know that if my conscience didn't get in the way, I would have put Dana on this list without a second thought. But, for the sake of diversity, I'll switch it up this time to a character who is arguably at a similar level, and that is Unica Tova from Ys Origin. This is a character who is best described as wears their heart on their sleeve. Unica's motivations to become a knight and ultimately join in with the investigation of Devil's Tower to find the twin goddesses is as simple as it gets. She was ostracised by many because of her lack of magic, found some unlikely friends in the goddesses themselves during her childhood, and now swears to protect them in any way she can. She's pretty much the adult template, but can speak and has a ponytail. Plus, she wears mitts. And even though I love Adol as the main face of Ys, it is refreshing to have someone like Unica share the spotlight as protagonist of Ys Origin. She gives a different perspective to the adventure that you don't often get in an Ys title, so I've always had a soft spot for her. 
And we round out this list with a bit of Trails goodness in a Stell Bright from Trails in the Sky. No surprise to long term viewers, I'm sure you saw this coming from a mile off, but to people who are unfamiliar with the poster girl of the Trails series, Estelle has one of the best character arcs I've seen in any JRPG from recent memory. Just like Unica, she starts off as gung ho, sprightly, and eager to show off her skills, which at the start of her journey are lacking to say the least. And it's quite clear that during the early stages, she's very dependent on others to pick up the slack. But as the Sky arc progresses, the role in evolution of Estelle Estelle takes a dramatic turn. She faces a notable barrier during her adventure, but instead of shying away from the challenge as many would do, she steps up to the plates befitting the nature of her character, and her development culminates with some of the best moments within the entirety of Trails. Her dialogue in one particular scene in the later stages of the Sky Arc reflects how Estelle has grown, but the key element that makes that moment so special is that Estelle deserves that moment. Her development up to that point was clearly defined, and this particular scene was the sweet cherry on top to illustrate that growth to the player. I know I I said this was in no particular order, but Estelle is easily my favourite character on this list. Though all of the characters in this video are what I consider to be quality protagonists in terms of the facets I judge them by, Estelle is the one that I feel displays those elements the best. And there's a reason she remains a fan favourite for Trails veterans even now. And there it is guys, 8 of the finest JRPG female pro tags from games I've played. Give me some of yours in the comments, it might even give me an idea of what I can add to my own backlog. See you next week for the monthly news roundup, and peace.